Good evening, everybody. Tonight, I wanted to talk to you about fibromyalgia and also touch a little bit on chronic pain as well. So fibromyalgia, well, this is something that until a few years ago, uh, sometimes people misunderstood it and they were telling patients, you know, this is all in your head and you're not really having all this pain. We have no evidence. There's nothing wrong with you. And if somebody happened to be a patient during that time frame, they would tell you that having such a invisible illness is uh, very disheartening because they would have all these symptoms and yet really nothing to show for it. No labs results, uh, nothing in particular. And then after a while, people started to notice that the people who were having these symptoms had some things in common. So for example, there are what we call uh, tender points uh, along the back and arms and legs and so forth that are especially uh, troublesome for people with fibromyalgia symptoms. And so after some time, a new diagnosis was born called fibromyalgia. And so right now, this is affecting about 1-2% to 2 of the population. Uh, women are much more affected than the men are, about uh, 10 times as a matter of fact. And symptoms can include things like fatigue, uh, sleep disorders, depression, anxiety is very commonly associated with it. Um, when you're in pain a lot, it's kind of hard to think, and so cognitive difficulties. Uh, headaches, uh, low back pain, irritable bowel syndrome, chronic fatigue, uh, sometimes symptoms of uh, rheumatoid and lupus uh, arthritis um, and osteoarthritis uh, can go along with it as well. Let's see, and there could be other vague symptoms that go along with it. So the cardinal thing for fibromyalgia is those tender points, and they've got criteria. You must have a certain number out of um, the tender points, you know, activated in order to qualify for the diagnosis and so forth, and those are in some of the references that I'll be putting up uh, after the presentation. So keep an eye down below in the comments section for some of the references and more information if you want to learn about the diagnosis. Now it's very common that when people have a chronic pain condition that it very much uh, impacts the um, ability to think and function. Kind of <laughs> so, uh, and it's very common that when people are in chronic pain that they also tend to get depressed. And so if you or a loved one is suffering from a chronic pain condition, uh, be mindful that as a necessity, it does commonly cause uh, mood disorders. And why do I say necessity? Well, it turns out that the pathways that our brain uses for pain perception are also some of the same pathways that we use in other cognitive functions. Uh, for example, ability to express yourself creatively or ability to uh, concentrate. And so when people are in chronic pain, the uh, pain pathways that are signaling to the brain keep going pain, 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 and it keeps pinging that same pathway. And it basically um, is very easy to take over the mind and the awareness. And so one of the techniques that can be used to help downregulate this uh, phenomenon is to do things that involve uh, the new field of neuroplasticity meaning uh, exercises such as creative visualization, creative writing, um, focusing on other things uh, besides the physical body. And believe it or not, there's some new uh, research that's being done on breathing techniques and other things that can be done to help refocus the mind away from the uh, chronic pain signals. And there's some neat uh, research on that, so I'll put a link to a book that I'm quite enjoying uh, that, um, that does explain some of these pathways in a little bit more detail. Now, because the pain pathways are so involved and so much of the brain is involved with this, uh, some of the more common treatments uh, for fibromyalgia include such medications as, you guessed it, because there's a chronic pain syndrome, and beginning level things are Motrin and Tylenol and the class called NSAIDs that is Motrin, Naproxen, Aleve, uh, that category of medications and some stronger ones as well. 
The trouble with Tylenol is that if a lot of it's taken over time, it can impact on the liver. And one of the troubles with Motrin, and one of the reasons why I like to use the herbal stuff in combination with medicines, is because if somebody takes that category of medications called NSAIDs, again, meaning Motrin, Naproxen, Aleve, and similar medications, well, they can cause heartburn, and it can also, over time, uh, cause damage to the kidneys. In fact, there's a disorder called NSAID-induced nephropathy, meaning too many NSAIDs over too long of a time uh, burns out the kidneys. <laughs> um, and so, thankfully, there's additional things that can be done too that will be very helpful for uh, this condition as well that will hopefully save your tummy and save your kidneys at the same time. Um, one of the next steps of treatments after very basic medications, such as uh, Tylenol and the more common over-the-counter medications, includes a category of medications called the tricyclic antidepressants. Now that's a very expensive word, as my friend would say. Um, and what that means, it's a type of medication that changes a little bit about the way the brain and the nerves perceive the pain. Now, again, this can be very helpful because these medications are usually taken in the evening because they make people very sleepy. And it turns out that sleep disorders and fibromyalgia are very commonly uh, linked. Many, many people with fibromyalgia have trouble sleeping, and that in turn causes more muscle pain and muscle um, discomfort as well. And so sometimes a low dose of something like uh, Elevil in the evening uh, can be helpful for modulating that and getting a deeper night's sleep. The drawback to that category of medications, though, is that it can also cause weight gain as well. So whenever using these medications, you always wanna to try to use the smallest amount necessary for the shortest amount of time. Um, next, sometimes people with this condition benefit from, again, a low dose of a SSRI, fancy word for um, medications in the category of uh, Prozac. And again, that's a nice one because it can come into low concentrations or low doses, but again, uh, things such as weight gain, sexual side effects, and so forth uh, can be inhibiting uh, to some of these medications, although sometimes they can be helpful. Uh, Lyrica and Cymbalta are two other medications that kind of change the perception of the pain over time, and those tend to be a little bit more useful, but again, the side effect, one of the main side effects is weight gain as well. And so this is another reason why, as much as possible, uh, being able to do additional therapies that are very good for um, pain relief and uh, symptom relief uh, can be very helpful as well. So let's get into some of those additional uh, kinds of therapies that can be helpful. And so, as you guys know, by watching my, uh, my channel for a little while now, I'm a big fan of using lifestyle medicine in addition to appropriate use of medications as a great combination therapy for treating and reversing uh, almost everything um, as well. So one thing that is a very, what I call low hanging fruit, something that is very easy to um, identify and look for in fibromyalgia sufferers is a vitamin D deficiency. So the theory there is that if the vitamin D level is low, then there's these little uh, glands around the thyroid here. Um, so the thyroid lives down here in the neck, and there's these little tiny dots of uh, glands on top of the thyroid. And because they're on top of the thyroid or next to the thyroid, they're called the parathyroid glands meaning like next to um, and then thyroid. Uh, so there's these little tiny dots called the parathyroid glands. These are very important in regulating your calcium metabolism and making sure that your bones stay strong and uh, that your body doesn't have too much or too little calcium. And so one of the things that can happen is if somebody is in our modern day, uh, it's very common for people to be very low in vitamin D. And if you happen to be low in vitamin D, then sometimes these little parathyroid glands uh, kind of go into overdrive and can create a uh, condition where their hormone 
parathyroid gland, so they make parathyroid hormone, where that hormone goes too high. And when that hormone goes too high, we get uh, the mnemonic in medical school, we called it bones, stones, groans, and psychiatric overtones. Again, we like things that rhyme, I guess, medicine. Um, and what that means is they have aches in their bones, they get kidney stones, um, they're groaning because of the pain, and uh, mood disorders uh, can result, so that's your psychiatric overtones uh, kind of thing. And I found a couple of folks with fibromyalgia-type symptoms that also had low vitamin D, and by replenishing the vitamin D, basically it significantly uh, helped with their uh, pain syndromes because when that is the case and the vitamin D is brought up, then the parathyroids uh, stop over-functioning and they go back down to normal, and then the hormones get kind of reset. So that is one thing that potentially can be a useful thing. Uh, for most people, uh, Dr. Greger talks about vitamin D in his uh, lectures. Uh, hasn't quite put the two together of fibromyalgia and vitamin D uh, yet. Um, but for most people, this is one of the few vitamin supplements that actually seems to be associated with uh, longevity as well. So most folks are okay with 1,000 or 2,000 units, and I'm just going to wave it at you because as an example for a prop, um, I'm sure there's about a bazillion varieties of this out in the grocery stores and the pharmacies around. Um, so a little bit of vitamin D or sunshine uh, can be helpful. In this day and age, a lot of us are wearing our clothes, we are not going out very much, um, and so there's very little bit of skin that's usually exposed in general these days. Um, and if you're wearing a hat, maybe you've only got a little piece of skin here, and maybe a little bit on the, the hands or something. And so, again, with our very indoor lifestyles nowadays in the modern age, uh, people tend to get very little sunshine exposure. So most folks, about 30 minutes-ish of sunshine a day uh, can be helpful for uh, keeping the vitamin D levels up. If someone uh, happens to be of a darker skin tone, they just have a little bit of extra um, uh, melanin, which is a natural kind of sunscreen. And so uh, folks, the darker the skin tone, generally speaking, the more at risk of the vitamin D deficiency they are having. Um, or if you happen to go outside wearing a bunch of sunscreen all the time, you're also going to be a little bit higher risk um, for this uh, deficiency. So anyway, so for most folks, about 1,000, 2,000 units of vitamin D a day seems to be about the right number to bring those levels up uh, slowly over time. And so that can be a uh, beneficial um, uh, thing in this condition. Alrighty, next. Um, so low impact exercise. So what do I mean by low impact exercise? This is things like muscle strengthening and flexibility. And about three times a week is what they say is about right for folks with the fibromyalgia because when the muscles are kind of sore and inflamed, you want to gradually get them um, working up to speed. And this is very helpful at um, helping to treat the symptoms. One of the worst things folks can do when they have this is basically to take to the bed and lock themselves in a dark room and stare at the ceiling and the walls and, uh, and that sort of thing because not only can this uh, chronic pain become very isolating, but also uh, when you're in, indoors and not around other folks and so forth, you're not getting that social stimulus and you're also um, um, basically there's not much else to focus on besides the pain uh, in these circumstances and so not getting that natural uh, level of distraction as well and so sunshine and uh, exercise and more specifically exercises that do low impact and aerobic uh, so one example is um, hatha yoga so various uh, stretching and strengthening postures uh, can be very helpful. Sometimes people benefit from talking to a physical therapist who is experienced in some of these um, uh, disorders such as fibromyalgia. Uh, there's a few other connective tissue disorders as well that tend to be um, similarly having trouble with pain, like for example Ehlers-Danlos, which is a common um, genetic disorder that causes some um, chronic aches and pains in the, in the muscles and the joints and ligaments as well. 
All right, next. So we covered a few of the things that um, uh, are the symptoms from fibromyalgia, as well as a couple of easy things that can be done through um, uh, lifestyle factors that can help improve the symptoms. And finally, I'm getting to the uh, one of the best treatments that I've seen so far, and that is a, guessed it, whole food plant-based diet. Uh, so Dr. Greger does some nice reviews, and there's a study or two that they talked about um, basically putting patients with this condition on a whole food plant-based diet, and in only three weeks, uh, seven out of 10 patients felt better. Uh, improved pain, improved symptoms, improved mood, all of that and with only three weeks of a plant-based diet. And so why is that? Well, uh, if you watch these presentations, you'll learn that within minutes of having some of these uh, plant foods, you're basically flooding the body with antioxidants and pain-fighting chemicals, for the most part, that do a wonderful thing at resetting the body's uh, natural state of the immune system, state of inflammation, and other pain markers. For example, uh, berries are very good at fighting muscle pain, and foods such as uh, turmeric, highly, highly recommend turmeric for my folks with uh, any chronic pain syndrome, a uh, quarter teaspoon a day of turmeric powder, and that's just the bright gold um, spice that you find in the grocery store. <laughs> um, or if you buy it in bulk, uh, you can get a little bit more. <laughs> but basically, it's very, very good for fighting chronic pain and inflammation. And, oh, by the way, it prevents Alzheimer's and prevents colon cancer and has a multitude of other health benefits on the body as well. And so it is one of those simple things that a quarter teaspoon of turmeric once, twice, or three times a day, depending on the level of pain, uh, it's a very good overall body tonic. And no, I'm not meeting like just meeting it uh, directly off the spoon, but adding it to things like uh, oatmeal or I have a soy milk chai that I add it to in the mornings. So, um, uh, it can be very, very helpful for improving pain. Uh, other foods that help fight pain and inflammation also include uh, beets and uh, mutton mushrooms. Um, ginger, an eighth of a teaspoon, uh, two or three times a day can be very helpful as well. Uh, next to me, I've got a few props for a few additional things that could be helpful as well. So if you check out Dr. Greger's uh, video on um, foods that fight pain and inflammation. Uh, there's a whole list of uh, spices and foods that are especially good at fighting pain and inflammation. And those foods, I would highly recommend uh, anybody with any chronic pain syndromes to especially indulge in because, hey, you gotta eat anyway. You may as well have food that helps you heal and makes your body um, feel better as well. So. Another thing that can be very helpful with folks with chronic pain syndromes is uh, foods like uh, rosemary. This is one fresh in the garden, hence uh, you get the little purple flowers, so a little <laughs> demonstration there. So some of these simple uh, foods can be taken, um, basically you can add it to something like uh, potatoes or rosemary potatoes. You can um, have the rosemary tea to get some of the anti-inflammatory benefits from it. Or you can just uh, eat it directly, I guess, but it's usually more fun for things like this to make it into a tea or cook it into the food in some way or another. Now, believe it or not, a lot of these uh, simple herbs have been made into various um, things like bath salts and lotions and such that can be applied uh, topically to the areas that are sore. And so I'll show you a couple of uh, variations, and again, this is just things that you can find in a local grocery store around here. So, for example, uh, this one here is a bath salt kind of thing that includes eucalyptus, uh, spearmint, and menthol. And menthol is a fancy word for mint. Uh, a lot of people uh, know it in one of the more uh, popular forms, like menge. And here, uh, again, the, one of the active ingredients is menthol. 10%, so that's why anybody who uses the stuff smells strongly like mint afterwards. Uh, methyl salicylate is another uh, topical pain curler, and camphor. Um, just as a thing uh, to make note of, people have been using um, certain plants like this for their pain relieving properties for literally 
thousands and thousands of years. Uh, there was a neat study shown recently that showed that some of the Neanderthals that were living in Spain, uh, the ones that were living by the plains, uh, basically had a bunch of um, uh, bones and they studied the calculus of tartar in the teeth and they found, you know, um, animal products in them. And then they found a group of Neanderthals living in the woodlands of Spain that seemed to be vegan uh, because all they found in their uh, teeth was uh, bits of mushrooms and other plants. And they found a Neanderthal that had evidence of like a tooth infection or something. And sure enough, it had been chewing on a type of bark that contained salicylic acid. <laughs> and so again, people have been using plants pharmacologically for pretty much forever, you know, as, as long as we've been able to identify plants that made us feel good and uh, and so forth. So, anyway, um, one other example is, and you guys note this carefully, this is the only homeopathic thing that I ever recommend, ever, and that's because, uh, in my opinion, most of the homeopathic uh, remedies uh, don't work because they're kind of diluted out to um, nothingness. And, um, anyway, so... The thing that makes this one different is that it's actually not diluted. <laughs> um, it's actually got a, a strong enough concentration of the active ingredient to make a difference, and that's the arnica. And so, again, this is uh, something that can help relieve um, muscle aches and pains as well. Uh, next, another uh, solution to helping to relieve some of these chronic pains is uh, various uh, kinds of things you can do with hydrotherapy and aromatherapy all at the same time. So again, just by an example, this is a type of uh, bath salts that it's Epsom salt and so it's got magnesium which uh, can get absorbed a little bit by the body and uh, help open up the uh, muscles and the blood flow to these areas. And then um, it's also got uh, rosemary and mint in this particular example. There's a lot of varieties of these things. Sometimes they have lavender and other uh, variations of um, herbs that can be added to the water essentially to enhance the, um, the functioning. Uh, and another fun thing, at one of the local fairs, there was a little girl that was selling homemade lotions and so I've got two of them here. Um, one of them has a little bit of uh, lavender and tea tree, and the other um, basically includes some of the uh, essential oils that are good for um, fighting pain inflammation. Um, um, so, uh, like jojoba oils and, and so forth. So, again, there's a lot, a lot of variations, even sometimes homemade, uh, that could be uh, helpful for rubbing onto sore areas and helping to improve uh, symptom relief as well. Next, having fun. So, happy St. Patty's Day, everybody. <laughs> um, so, one of the uh, reasons that uh, people who are having uh, chronic pain can improve, uh, get an improvement in their symptoms uh, when they're laughing and having fun and um, basically kissing and uh, expressing themselves in these ways, um, basically, these release the feel-good hormones and at the same time, they um, change the focus away from the pain, 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 pain um, and help people to be able to um, enjoy their life a little bit more and to uh, and to be able to get out. Oops, didn't realize I had my uh, tag on there. <laughs> but anyway, but just to symbolize um, being able to um, have laughter as medicine. So in other words, um, uh, watching a comedy and actually laughing. It's the laughter that actually releases those hormones uh, to their best extent and helps people to feel better. Um, there was another study that showed that people that were watching a drama and basically got moved to tears uh, over the drama, it also helped release those uh, good hormones and people felt better um, and less inflammation as a result as well. Alrighty, so my last uh, lifestyle tip for fibromyalgia and other chronic pain sufferers is going to be an uh, interesting one for um, its effect on the entire system. And this is a new presentation that Dr. Greger uh, put together and I'm going to add uh, some of my own spin on it as well. So in my outside life, I do some yoga, meditation, and um, 
things that you experience similarly to that. And so I've got a lot of familiarity with uh, basic breathing practices that have been taught for quite a long time as well. So kind of like people have been chewing on um, uh, different kinds of uh, sticks and twigs and plants to help with pain relief. Uh, people have also been uh, playing with uh, breath awareness to help with reducing anxiety uh, tension and um, be very helpful as well. So for the physiology of this next segment, um, there's a big nerve called the vagus nerve. Um, nope, has nothing to do with Las Vegas and the glitz and the glitter out there, but vagus uh, means wanderer. It's basically a ginormous nerve that goes down from the brain and it goes pretty much all over the place. It goes to your heart, it goes to your gut, it goes to your lungs, and it's a huge um, thing that regulates that whole uh, mind-body um, connection. And if I dare say mind-body-breath connection as well because um, a lot of people aren't able to just sit down and immediately imagine, okay, my heart's beating at 65 beats per minute, I want to change that down to 50 beats per minute or something along those lines. But uh, if somebody's breathing shallowly or breathing fast or has irregular breathing, that's something we can actually kind of consciously tap into and make a change by it. And by making a change to your breathing patterns, believe it or not, you can actually um, cause this uh, vagus nerve to, in a sense, uh, resonate and really uh, be the go-between uh, between, uh, the body and the mind and calm down the brain and calm down uh, the system. So Dr. Greger reviewed a study in which uh, he goes into a lot more detail about the resonance and, and so forth. But basically what they found to be a good rate of breathing was at about five and a half um, seconds on the inhalation and five and a half seconds on the exhalation. Now, if somebody's not used to um, breathing that slowly, it might be something that you wanna kind of ease into. Um, so in other words, you're always, always, always mindful of your own individual capacity. And you know, just enjoy and play around with this idea. So in clinic, occasionally I'll be able to teach people a little bit about diaphragmatic breathing. And this is something that it's a little tricky to teach kind of over a screen. Um, but the main point is, is that the diaphragm is right below here. I'll do a quick uh, back up so I have a little more space on there. But the diaphragm is right below the rib cage. And basically, uh, you can feel that diaphragm by touching right at the uh, spot in between uh, where the ribs are coming together. There's a soft spot there called the solar plexus. And by kind of becoming a familiar with that space, um, then you can learn to um, tap into the movement of the diaphragm, which essentially goes uh, from being a dome to being flat to being a dome again. And that's the real muscle and movement of breathing. And a lot of times when people are uh, in pain or stressed out, then they breathe very shallowly or they breathe a lot with their chest, or they breathe a lot with their shoulders. I'm exaggerating, for for example, um, with this. But the point is, is that there's almost no lung tissue up here. Um, when we are raising and lowering our shoulders in the breathing process, it's a sign of stress, and it's also um, tension-inducing. It causes a lot of extra tension up in here and across the upper shoulders, which also happens to be some of the main areas of pain in uh, places such as fibromyalgia um, patients. So the idea is that um, if you are able to um, focus on the breathing for a little while, after a little while, you can gradually tap into what is your body's natural breathing pattern at this very moment, and then start to kind of slow it down and connect the inhalation and the exhalation and practice even breathing where it's uh, the same length uh, going in and out. And if you're able to slow it down to approximately five, five and a half, six seconds on the inhalation and the exhalation, 
then that is one way of really tapping into this natural um, uh, natural vagus nerve um, uh, technique. Now, coming from um, my own meditation traditions and, and all, there's a few other variations of these um, breathing practices. And the simplest is a version of that where instead of um, you start off with even breathing, um, you know, slowing down the breath and making it even on the inhalation and the exhalation, connecting the breath and making it nice and smooth um, so that you're not holding the breath or doing anything along those lines. Because if you start to hold your breath, which is one of the common things in the popular um, um, apps and things, sometimes they'll say, inhale, hold, and then exhale, and then hold on the exhale. And, and that's one of those things that's gotten to be very popular. Um, but I think when you look at how does the body react to that, it ends up releasing more of those uh, stress hormones and, and so forth. And so it's much more natural for the body because um, when it's in its natural state, it's a nice even um, uh, breathing pattern as well. But another thing that can be done with the breath is to focus on making it smooth and even and then um, doing a nice slow breath for the inhalation, but then slowing it down to about twice as much on the exhalation. So in other words, to slow down the exhalation, and that has a wonderful, wonderful calming effect on the nervous system as well as the uh, mind as well. So one of the um, neat little science things that goes along with this as well is that by tapping into this um, breathing pattern, you're actually potentially um, not only strengthening and toning that vagus nerve, but you're also impacting the uh, rate at which the heart is beating as well. And there's been a lot of studies that show that when people are in uh, distress or when they're in pain, uh, their heart rate goes up. And also when people are more relaxed or fit, like our uh, athletes, for example, then the heart rate tends to be lower. And there seems to be some correlation uh, with heart rate over uh, 65 beats per minute as a independent effect on uh, longevity as well. And so um, higher resting heart rate, higher risk of heart attacks and sudden cardiac death. Um, let's see, so there was a study, I'm just checking my notes here, that men with a pulse greater than 90 beats per minute uh, basically had five times higher risk of sudden cardiac death than the gentleman who had a heart rate that was less than 60. And also um, uh, much higher rates of uh, things like heart failure and heart disease and, and so forth. And so these um, breathing patterns um, actually help with your, your heart's ability to uh, slow itself down, but also exercising the, the heart rate uh, variability. So, Things would be very boring if the heart just went boom, 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 get a little dance there, <laughs> and that it had no uh, rate change whatsoever. But when tapping into these breathing patterns, they found that um, that on one end of the inhalation, the heart rate was just a tiny bit faster. On the other end of the um, exhalation, the heart rate was just a different uh, rate altogether. And so by varying, um, the heart rate in this way by such such a simple thing as um, as tapping into this breathing rhythm, um, basically they're able to find that the overall heart rate and the health of the heart was greatly improved as well. So who knew? You do uh, one simple breathing exercise for uh, relaxation and for um, kind of helping to release uh, some of the stress and the tension and just because it feels good and it's fun, and you end up um, helping to um, to improve the heart health at the same time. Uh, there's other couple of things that could be helpful for the um, heart rate as well, and that is having um, beans and greens and, and so forth as well. So there is one say that showed a cup of beans every day, um, beans, chickpeas, lentils, um, not only lowered the person's uh, A1C, that's a marker for diabetes stuff, uh, but also lowered the heart rate by about 3.4 beats per minute, 
which was, believe it or not, hi Jeff, um, which is, believe it or not, the same as uh, running 250 hours on the treadmill every week. And so nothing wrong with running on the treadmill. If someone's having a lot of chronic pain though, probably better for them to start off with, you know, three times a week, some very simple uh, stretching and other strengthening uh, programs and eat your beans every day anyway, uh, so that you have even better um, heart and also it's um, wonderful for all of those micronutrients at the same time. Alrighty, so I think I've covered uh, almost everything that was on my checklist for uh, fibromyalgia uh, sufferers tonight. So again, uh, did anybody have any questions? Now's the time to um, put them into the, um, into the presentation box and uh, let's see. So next week I'll be covering another chronic disease and that is uh, irritable bowel syndromes, uh, basically the ones that are more inflammatory. So I did an irritable bowel already, you know, so check out that presentation. But the Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis are going to be my talk for next week and there's going to be a fair amount of overlap because some of the same things just happen to be very common amongst all these um, conditions. So yes, it's very true that uh, food can have a tremendous uh, healing impact on the body. So choosing things like your beans and greens and uh, beets and uh, mushrooms and other foods that are specifically anti-inflammatory like your turmeric and, and so forth can have a wonderful healing effect on the body. Um, doing things for the mind, such as um, being with loved ones, uh, focusing on happy thoughts and comedies and uh, so forth uh, can have a wonderful impact, uh, not just on the perception of the pain, but on health and longevity and enjoying life a little bit more as well. So check out the comment section below. I'll be putting a few more uh, thoughts and ideas um, on there. So. There's going to be um, there's going to be some other uh, links in there for a few other books. Um, I will reference again. Um, if you've not seen the video about the um, brain's health, uh, that one is really really pertinent to the fibromyalgia. So please check that one out as well. And Dr. Barnard of the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine has done some wonderful writings on, um, hi Gervinder, um, has done some wonderful writings on uh, basically foods that fight pain inflammation. In fact, that's the title of his book, Foods That Fight Pain, who knew? And it's only a penny on Amazon, last time I checked, um, it's been a penny on Amazon for at least the last year or so, plus something like $3 shipping and handling. Um, it's a wonderful uh, book with a lot of information in it as well. And the book on um, the brain's way of healing, the whole first chapter is dedicated to chronic pain and that stuff that I was talking about with uh, the um, brain pathways uh, where chronic pain uh, influences the, the mind um, pathway as well is, is outlined in exquisite detail in that book as well. So. Alrighty, well I hope you guys uh, eat your beans and greens and uh, berries and enjoy your other uh, fruits and veggies and uh, are able to help improve your chronic pain. So it's been lovely sharing this evening with you. And remember, go out there and have fun, okay? <laughs> Alright, good night y'all.